Okay, the class, the name of the class, Meaning of Life. <laughs> so um, today, uh, brief lecture, uh, not a whole lot. Um, let me make sure I've got this open. So it, I'm going to be reading from this. I'm not going to write every quote down. Uh, if you if you want to, I, I, I was thinking about printing this out like old school and going to the coffee machine and having it hand out for the first day. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to waste all the paper. I'll just use the projector. And now I'm like kicking myself for not doing that. But um, the PDF file is the first thing you'll see if you go on Blackboard you know, and you click on course content. There's a uh, meaning of life quote. And so, so today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about meaning. Now, what is the meaning of meaning? Interesting question. Uh, and then we'll get into life, right? But uh, these quotes really focus on the second one. And I kind of want to start with the quotes. So the, the quotes, in a way, you can look at these quotes and they all kind of present somewhat different responses to the, or the question of what life, what its purpose, what its meaning is. And so I, I think this is a fun kind of introduction to the course. Fortunately, you can't have it up here. This is, this is Kierkegaard. So this first quote is, is from Kierkegaard. He's the first philosopher we'll be reading. Uh, it's probably one of his most famous quotes. He's, he once wrote that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Right, so the, you know, I, I guess you can think about your own life in this context, and maybe not your life as a whole, but certain episodes in your life. And like, what the hell was I doing? And what did that mean? And sometimes that meaning changes. You know, maybe that's sort of a defense mechanism because you know maybe you had a bad breakup and you want to like tell yourself a story that makes you feel better about it, like oh he was a jerk or she was bad or you know whatever, or at least I learned from it or I grew from it or something like this. You know. Uh, but as we're living it, in the midst of it, Kierkegaard wants to say, it can't be really understood. And this is a, this is a theme that you're going to see throughout the course, but it's, it's funny because they're, they're, this, this idea that life is a big mystery that we're sort of immersed in, and because of that, there's no way to sort of step out of it and reflect on it in any objective way. This belief, as common as it is, there's another belief that's probably not you might say the opposite, that's just as common. Oh, life, the meaning, it's like no big deal. So the next quote from Alan Watts is kind of along this day. Alan Watts says, the meaning of life is just to be alive. It is so plain and so obvious and so simple. And, it, and yet everybody rushes around in a great panic as if it were necessary to achieve something beyond themselves. So this, to me, expresses a kind of an opposite sentiment. The first quote from Kierkegaard is like, oh, life is a mystery. We'll never understand it. You know, you have to live it. But it doesn't make sense. And you have to deal with that burden your whole life. Now Watts is kind of saying, oh, God, you're such a drama queen. Just live it, right? You're looking for something big and something beyond yourself, some great answer to the big question of the universe. Just, just go eat a taco, man. It's, that's all it's about. Go pet your dog. You know, go take a walk in the park. That's the meaning. Just be alive, right? So there's those two kind of responses. I would say different responses. And to me, they're, they kind of make sense, both of them. You know, they've got their merits. It's hard to sort of go on one side or the other. I love this. This is a line from John Lennon. Uh, life is what happens to you while you're trying to figure, sorry. Life is what happens while you're trying to, uh, while you're busy making other plans. I butcher that one. Right? Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. You've got all these sort of high for I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, first I'm gonna degree, I'm gonna get this job, I'm gonna move to, to this city, get this kind of apartment. It's like you ever seen that movie Fight Club? You know what's like, yeah, you don't watch the Fight Club, it's a good movie. Right? The, the main character is kind of like uh, well, you know, I'm gonna have this job, I'm gonna get married, you know. He's got this whole plan in his head, then he'll start, then he'll do stuff, right? And John Lennon's like, yeah, that's what you think. Right? You're gonna plan everything. Life is what you get thrown at you, basically. All right, next. This is a brutal, no, no, this is not a brutal one. This is more of an abstract one. The brutal one is next. This is Wittgenstein, Austrian uh, philosopher. <clears throat> he says that we feel that even if all possible scientific questions be answered, 
the problems of life have still not been touched at all. Of course, there is then no question left. And just this is the answer. The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of this problem. I like this quote because paradoxically, it kind of combines the first two sentiments. Right? It kind of makes the answer to life mysterious, but it's not, it's only mysterious because it's so simple and stupid and like you're making a big fuss about it, right? And it's not, and also, again, it's mysterious because it can't be answered scientifically, right? It can't be, you can't encapsulate it in some formula, right? But yet, the problem goes away once you figure that out. Then you, you're no longer making a fuss about it. Then you're back to the Alan Watts. Just be alive. Just, just, just live. Just obvious. Here's the brutal, the brutal one. This is a, almost like a biological definition of life, although I think you can take you can interpret this several ways. Nietzsche writes, what is life? Life, that is, continually shedding something that wants to die. Life, that is, being cruel and inexorable against everything about us that is growing old and weak. And not only about us. Life, that is, then, being without reverence, for those who are dying, who are wretched, who are ancient, constantly being a murderer. Very brutal, right? Yeah, this is sort of the uh, Hobbesian kind of brutal, like life is death, basically, right? In order to live, you have to kill, right? All life sheds other things. Right? This is sort of the naivete of, the naivete of the vegan who thinks otherwise, right? I don't want to hurt anyone because they're so peaceful and lovely. Right? Love and life. Plants live, but they're not sentient. Right? I mean, they can communicate to each other through chains of vines and shit like that. I mean, maybe they're not like feeling whatever. It's like, but you, you breathe in, you breathe out, you kill stuff. But I think for Nietzsche, too, he broadens this more to like a personal level. Too. He's pretty, you know, he talks about self-overcoming, right? If you live, that means letting your old self die and new qualities not holding on to things that need to go away, right? Not trying to like resuscitate a past that's dying and dead and decrepit and, 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 and growing, right? Somebody wanted to jump in, I thought I saw it. Yeah. It's almost like something that you can never give life back once you're gone. Right. Yeah, I mean, for Nietzsche, and again, this is kind of cruel, but he had quite a disdain for um, the idea of trying to sort of fix society with you know all these prescriptions and like just do this and order society this way and for Nietzsche he's like there's some things that the best thing for you to do is let them die let leave them alone they don't need to be helped right like in fact by helping them you're 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 putting all these resources into something that is futile and it's going to dissipate strength in you and in general yeah so it's like a Kind of cool though. It's like uh, don't help anybody you need. Either. You know, don't let them die. They're, they're meant to. You know, like, yeah, it's it's pretty brutal. But again, I think there's many ways of understanding that quote too. Sometimes in life, everybody is not meant to go. Like, not everybody is what? Not everybody is able to go in the direction you're going. Some of them right, right. Yeah, I think he has also this idea in much of his writing about. And he was very anti-democratic for this reason, because he thought that modern society was organized to kind of pull down greatness and to push up mediocrity and kind of level right. everybody, make everything the same and equal and easily manageable right. and, and very cookie cutter. And he thought, that's wrong. Like Some people are going to be violent, some people are going to be weak. And you just kind of let things sort of be what they are, and that's how they're going to thrive. You know? right. <clears throat> but let's look at Picasso. He's the next guy I got on the list here. This quote, um, I, I quite like it actually. He says, The meaning of life uh, is to find your gift. And then, the, the, what does he say after that? He says, The purpose of life is to give it away. Right? I love that, right? So, I, I find myself, when people ask me, you know, what the meaning of life is, I'm like, Well, that's individual. That's an answer you got to answer yourself. But to me, your life ain't shit if it doesn't have other people involved. And so you've got to, you know, you can talk about, I want this, I want that. If I get this car in this apartment and live in this neighborhood, and I'm going to have these cool friends, it's so great. You can't give anything 
you're, you're losing something, right? You fi find what you're good at, find what it is you can give to the world, and that's gonna give your life purpose and, and meaning, right? And we're, kind of, we're kind of segueing into meaning. Okay. Okay. But yeah, if you want a meaningful life, you can't limit it to yourself. You've gotta have friends, family, somebody to share your, your gifts with us. Okay, this one is, I think, a kind of a funny one, but um, it's from the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 42 is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. That was, that was a character, a, a supercomputer named Deep Thought from the science fiction novel, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And they basically said, the answer to the ultimate question is 42. The answer's not what the mystery, the question is what, what the hell the question is, right? Like, what question are we supposed to ask that gets the answer 42? Like, 42 is supposed to answer everything, just some number, right? Uh, I think it's a sort of a joke on the author's part, Douglas Adam, it's kind of a joke. But in a way, it's, it's one way some people try to approach the answer to life, is they look for a formula. Right? Now, 42 is, I think, just a joke, and he just made it up. Although, if you go on the internet, there's all sorts of like theories about, oh, 42 is this mystical number, and it's a base, whatever. And, you know, but even the author's like, no, I, when I was writing a book, I looked at the window, and I was like, 42, sounds like a good number to 42. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, all this stuff like, about it, you know, like trying to, and I think that that's kind of ironic, because to me, maybe this is my interpretation of this book, the whole point of it was to avoid that kind of stuff. It was sort of a joke, it was a parody of trying to, oh, it's 42, it must mean this and this and that. Sometimes it's just, it just made it up. It just right. came, it was random, right? Like it was just a random, it was random, right? That, that actual, that kind of thinking, I think, is very much in keeping with um, the second author that we'll be looking at, Kurt Vonnegut, when we read The Sirens of Titan. It's a science fiction novel. A lot of crazy, wacky things happen, and it kind of makes it seem like all the characters have no control over their fate. You know, it's kind of like, what do you do and how do you make meaning of life when everything seems so random? And, Purposeless, you know, and that's kind of the major theme of this, this work here. Last but not least, we've got Abraham Lincoln. He says, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. What is he saying there? It's not the, yeah. I, I would think that if we put into the years where you were living right. before you died. Before right, so you might die. When did, when did MLK die? Like, it was early 40s, right? Was it like 41, 42? Yeah. Think about how much that man did you know, before he got, you know, horribly taken down. I mean, that's just amazing, and it makes me ashamed, honestly. <laughs> when I went to go, when I went to go visit the the uh, the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis where he got shot, I, I got the emotional pocket. Yeah, I just feel ashamed. Like, man, this guy, I've been what he did. I look at me. I'm just some jerk off philosophy professor. <laughs> you know. Like, but you can't be too hard on yourself, right? You know, like, right. to me, King didn't even want that. You know, he was, it was, that was thrown on him. You know, I'm a big fan of that, obviously. But I remember watching this documentary talking about how when he first gave his first speech and had the first meeting, he didn't want to. He's like, oh, no, I support you. He's like, no, you're going to be the leader. He's like, uh, I don't think so. Like, no, you're the leader. People respect you. They like the way you talk. You're the leader. He's like, all right, I'll take it. You know, so. But, so he found his purpose. I think it kind of ties in a little bit to the quote, the Picasso, find your gift. He had a gift for oratory, for inspiration, right? For sort of bridging gap between people, all sorts of people are struggling. And he used that, he shared it with the world, right? And somebody say that he didn't live a meaningful life. He did. Are they looking, were they, were they paying attention? You know what I mean? So, so definitely. <clears throat> now, what does it mean to me? <laughs> what is the meaning of meaning? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is in the course description. So we have to spend a little bit of class time talking about meaning. What is meaning? Uh, most of the semester we'll be talking about life, right? What is the meaning of life? Ironically, I would say like just asking the question, what is the meaning of meaning? It kind of already assumes you know the answer, right? Because right? it's like you're asking for the meaning of meaning. Well, you're asking for something that... Can you ask for, yeah, could I have a, I would like to have a dually doy. I just made that word up. Okay. Do I know what I'm asking for? No. So if you say, what's the meaning of this? Then it's assumed you already know what it, what it means to me. Here are some theories though. 
and I'm not going to go over every single theory because this is not a course on the philosophy of language. I don't even know if they offer a philosophy of language course here at UH downtown. It's not a popular course. I think it's actually a lot. It's a lot more fascinating than it sounds. Actually, like philosophy of language is where you talk about grammar and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, um, philosophy of language, particularly. Uh, the kind of philosophy of language that was being done at the turn of the century, the early like 1900s, the early early uh, part of the 20th century, um, a lot of the philosophy of language was just trying to analyze what is language at all, right? What is this phenomenon that we call language, and how does it work, basically? And so, in this process, you get all these different philosophers coming with the different theories of meaning. You know, what what is the meaning of a word? Okay, now. One of the popular responses, and probably still today, one of the most popular responses, if you're a philosopher, to the question of what is the word mean and what is a word, people like like Bertrand Russell. I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably read a little bit of Russell if we have time. But Bertrand Russell, he said that words were reference. What what that means is they refer to objects. Okay, so the word desk corresponds or refers, denotes, another word they like to use, a physical thing, an actual desk. So there's this sort of correspondence between a word and an object that exists in the universe. And that's just language. That's all it is. Pretty simple. Straightforward. Right? But then you get people like Wittgenstein, who I uh, mentioned earlier. And they're going to say, look, um, this approach to language doesn't really work. Right? What you basically end up with, with, with Russell's kind of approach to language, that every word, its meaning is what it refers to. The word desk means desk, means that thing, right? That's what it is. It's simple, okay? So Wittgenstein's like, well, wait a minute. This is basically a form of logical atomism. You break down language into its parts, its atoms, right? You try to analyze it in terms of this word means this, this word means that, the stream in a sentence, and then it means the other. And, and Wittgenstein says, this doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite work. Imagine I have like a, a model airplane, and somebody says, that, that, that model airplane, you know, I, let's say it's not put together yet. It just came out of the box. And somebody says, man, look at that box. Look at that picture of the model airplane on the box. I want, I want one of those. Could you make one for me? And you're like, yeah, I'll do it for like 100 bucks. I'm like, cool, all right. So you dump all the parts out on the table. You've got the wings. I'm not the best artist on the fly. So you've got the wings. You've got the fuselage, right? You've got the little propellers, right? And you know all these little parts, maybe like a little tail fin or something like that. Okay, <laughs> and I just lay all this stuff on the table and I tell you, see there, there you go. There's your plane. Where's my hundred bucks? You're like, that's not that what I asked for. I want the freaking plane. You're like, well, it's right there. See, look, there's the wheels right here. Right there's the, the propeller. You got everything you need for a plane, right? No. What do you want? What do we need? What 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 do we need? Got to put them together, right? So if you try to analyze language in terms of its parts and individual parts, you really can't do it. You have to see how language works together, how they relate to each other, right? So Wittgenstein, he opts for a more holistic view of language, a sort of what you would call holism. Let's look at how language uh, works, and all language has to sort of be understood in a context. It's not just a simple listing of properties and all this stuff. You have to understand how they, how the words fit together and how the sentences are constructed and things like that. But ultimately, Wittgenstein comes to the conclusion that really, we can never come up with a theory of language that explains language. We would have to step outside of language to do it. Because, you know, well, imagine um, somebody painted a portrait of your favorite pop star, rock star, or whatever, your favorite celebrity. And then your favorite celebrity walked in the room and stood right next to that portrait. And you're standing there with this, this you're looking at this person and you're, you're like, dude, 
Look at that portrait. They look exactly like who painted that. That portrait is perfect. Like, it looks just like, uh, I don't know, Beyonce or whoever you're being, whatever, right? It looks just like her. And they're like, I don't see it. I don't see it. And you're like, but well, look, look, her nose, perfect. Her hair, I, oh, I see how her, yeah, I see that. Okay, we'll see how the whole, no, I don't see it. I don't see it. But the biggest is there's no way to say it. You either, it's just shown, as he says. There are some things that can be explained and some things we have to pass over in silence. They're only made manifest. And that's the early Wittgenstein. Later he comes to the conclusion that language does work. It does work. But it's very loose. It's not, a, it's definitely not an exact science, the way that your English instructors try to treat it with their grammar rules and all that stuff, right? <laughs> Ultimately, Wittgenstein's later theory is that words are tools. They are used for certain things in certain contexts, and there are different ways that we use language. And the meaning of the word is its use. So there's no absolute meaning to the word game, for instance. Right? That's one of his most famous examples. He talks about um, the, word, the word in German is spiel which is even a more difficult word to define than, than game is. Because uh, spiel, I mean, game has pretty wide connotations in English, but spiel is even worse in the German. But let's just think about it. Could you give me a definition for the word game that counts every time? You can't give a bunch of just one definition. Anytime you word, use the word game, this is what you mean, no matter what. Is there such a definition? No, and he says there can never be. There's no such thing as a perfect definition. The word means what it means in that context. Sometimes we're talking about a game, talking about playing the board games, sometimes I'm watching a sports game on TV. Guy has game, right? What is that what you're gonna say? No, I was gonna say, are you the, are you, are you game, game for this? Are you are, yeah. 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 Is there a way to word it and it has to do with Exactly. I'm gonna go hunting for game. You know, right. you're gonna go hunt for pheasant or something, right? Um, I'm missing some, right? I don't like guys that play games with me. I hate it so much, but I gotta talk to him. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's so many uses for that word. So for Wittgenstein, he says there's really no universal definition. But what there is typically, why these, why there are these several uses for game, and it makes sense, it doesn't confuse us, we understand them, is because there's a sort of what he calls a family resemblance. So there's the, he's got a, the famous theory of family resemblance of language, right? That, that there's meaning in these words, and there might not be, again, some universal definition for the word game, but there's a certain resemblance, the way they're used. Almost like if you saw a family of four or five people walking down the street, you don't know them, but you look at them, they're, they're a family. That's the dad, that's the mom, that's the two kids. But then you got your buddy who's like this philosophy jerk. He's like, how do you know they're a baby? Maybe they're not. And you're like, do they all have the same eye color? And you're like, well, two of them got blue, two of them got green, whatever. Well, do they all have the same, you know, do they all have the same height? Is there one characteristic they all share? And I know, but there's a sort of overlap of qualities and sort of a, a resemblance amongst those uses. So for Wittgenstein, a lot of the ways that we've approached language in the past, and you know, we're not gonna cover this a whole lot in the, in the course, uh, is a little bit too technical. We, we think that, that language works the way mathematics works, and the way laws of physics works. It's a lot looser. In fact, language itself, and the way we use it, and the way we learn it, is much like a game. In fact, this is another theory he's famous for, the theory of language games. And um, whenever you learn how to play a game, for the first time. How do you learn it? You know, the first time you play football or basketball or even like Monopoly or checkers or chess or whatever. How did you learn how to play that game? Did you sit down and read the rule book? No. no. You have to play it. Usually you play it without really knowing how to play it. Maybe you have some friends that already know the rules and they kind of guide you along. So you play a few rounds, just practice until you get the hang of it. Sometimes you don't even have to do that. You watch them enough and you just pick up on it, right? right. Similar thing with language, says Wittgenstein, 
right? Words, we, we, we see how they're used in certain contexts, what, they, what works and what doesn't, and that's how we sort of pick up on language. And much like the games that we play, sports and things like that, the rules change. The rules change. You know, the NBA, I don't, I'm not a big sports guy, but I know they constantly changing the rules. And it's usually in response to, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's response to how the game is played. Right. You know, sometimes the teams will ride the clock. You know, they're, they're riding the clock, and they change that rule right. so they stop riding the clock or whatever. Right. You, you had an example? I, I had an example. Uh, it's almost like you were born in the 70s, and you were talking to it in 2000. Right. Yeah, the word lit. Right. The word lit. I remember, like, <laughs> like for my parents, the word lit means drunk. You're drunk off your ass. Right, right. I'm Gen X. Lit means you're stoked. You smoke a lot of weed. Right, right. Millennials and Gen and the Gen Z or whatever they call you guys, right. and lit. Oh, it's lit. It's like party time. You know, it's it's awesome in here. It's so lit up. You know, like so. Yeah, like, the word the word gay. The word gay. Like less than a century ago, nobody ever used the word gay to mean homosexual. Never. Never. Ever. And but now it's the opposite. No one ever uses the word gay to mean happy or jovial. Right. You ever heard, what a gay time we had. Right. Yeah. No one says that anymore. But you know, listen to some songs from like the 1950s, right. 1960s, pop songs and stuff. You know, we had a gay time. You know, right. It's like they use it a lot. Right. But people hear it now, they're like, oh, oh, oh it's so good. Yeah. Right. Right. It kind of reminds me, like the language game concept, kind of reminds me of like when people pick up a new language, for example, and they're trying to figure out how to use it. You know what right. I'm saying? Like a different rules and different things that come with it. I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and I think that when teachers teach, like when you take a class and learn another language, they'll often say things like, you learn a language, you learn the culture. And that kind of fits into Wittgenstein. He once said that if a lion could speak, you wouldn't understand it. Because the lion inhabits a world that's different from your world. And our language is kind of our world, you know, the way that we interact with people. And so, like, the French have like two or three words for chair. You know, they have, you know, like chaise, and I forgot the other one, but it's like very specific, armless chair, arm, like they have distinctions they might make. The, uh, you know, they have gendered uh, nouns, you know, like like in German, the moon is uh, masculine and the sun is feminine. In Spanish and in Italian, it's the opposite. So it's like, you know, and that might have connotations that makes them, you know, see the world differently. And different people might have to play different language games in different contexts. So I remember when I was a butcher, when I worked at Whole Foods, I used to tell people I was a butcher, but technically that's not correct. If I was at work in the meat market cutting, cutting meat, cutting steaks, and I called myself a butcher, my coworkers would have jumped on me and said, son, you ain't no butcher. I worked in a slaughterhouse for 10 years, and you ain't no. I'm like, because jar, I'm actually technically a meat cutter. Like, to be a butcher, you have to work in a slaughterhouse, work on whole sides, whole sides, not cutting in to the loins, but actual whole sides of beef. So, but if I was at a cocktail party and somebody asked me what I did, I'm like, I'm a meat cutter. I'll be like, I'm a butcher, I'm a butcher. You know, because that they'll understand. Because I hate when people give you their title. When you, right. I, I've never asked them what they do for a living anymore. Because right. right. you always get stuff. I'm the assistant administrator detective of the Southwest Region Coordinating Facility. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, I said, mean, I said the computer looked busy all day. You know? Right. 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 You know? um, but yeah, so people sometimes they don't understand. That you're, you're in a different place. You gotta, you, you know, you gotta change your language a bit so they can understand what the heck you're saying. But this happens a lot in politics. Or right? people are asking you another thing. Like when reading the Bible, yeah. Some people, it's, it's really paraphrasing. Most of the time, you don't understand, you don't understand the language or language. Right. Well, I think there's there's a whole discipline within Bible studies right. called hermeneutics where they try to they try to do away with that problem. But it's difficult to do because those texts are so old and we don't always have the original versions and right. some of them have been changed. But they try to like understand what does this word mean right. in the context of the time. Yes. And I try to tell Christians this about certain things that I know. Right. I, my minor was uh, religious studies. So I know about some of the stuff. They won't know and hear it. You know, when I tell about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, what it really right. meant, and it didn't really have much to do with homosexuality. It was right. a bit more like having to do with hospitality. Right. And I'm like, I'm not making this up. Like, these are people that study Judaism, that are Jewish people, that can read Hebrew, that know the history. I just watched a documentary and I explained right. it to me. Right. You know? <laughs> and I don't have a horse in the race, so I don't care. Right. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. You know, but people are like, no, no, my pastor at this church said it was gay people. So that's what it is. You know, I'm like, 
But you're not going to change someone's mind like that. Right. They've already made up their mind. That's what it means. And you're, you must be the devil trying to convince them. I'm like, look, man, I, just, I don't know. I don't know. This would be my brother. Oh, is that how he is? Yeah. There's some people that put a wall up. They're just dogmatic. They put a wall up. And they've already made up their mind. There's really not much you can do. You know? and, and honestly, I, it doesn't make much difference to me. I think it's fascinating. So I'm not going to push them. If I feel like... I'm getting them uncomfortable. I'm like, you know what? It's not that important. You know what I mean? I'm gonna go back to watching my document. You know what I mean? You know, go back to believe what you believe. You know, whatever. As long as you're not trying to force it on me and you know, me live my life a certain way. But yeah, so um, meaning, at least the way Wittgenstein envisions it, is always contextual, right? So when we ask the question, what is the meaning of life, then we kind of have to even put that in context. Because the word life can have several connotations. Okay? Well, when we talk about life, I guess. You know, if you were going to be really analytic and scientific about it, life is basically a biological process. So anything that metabolizes anything else, right. that kind of fits into the Nietzsche quote, right? To live, you got to kill, right? right? To, what does it mean to metabolize? Basically, to destroy, to break it down, right. right? You take other things as nutrients, you break them down and incorporate them into your own organism, right? As long as you're doing that, you're a living being. So plants have life, you know, humans have life. <laughs> but when somebody asks you the question, like, what is the meaning of life? I don't think that's what we have in mind, right? Uh, well, we're talking about something much more personal, right? Something maybe more biographical or autobiographical. What is the meaning of my life? Or if you want to think more generally, maybe not personally, but still not scientifically either, well, what is the meaning of life in general? Why are we here, right? Why do humans even live, right? Why isn't it just an empty universe with no living beings, just darkness and... And, 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 and stars. Now, I know religions are going to have their answer. You know, God has a mission for us or you know, whatever, right? Um, there's so many different answers to that question. Right. Usually, that's the kind of thing we're asking when we ask, what is the meaning of life? We're not asking for some scientific, well, it means that you might have a lie. You know, the, that's not usually what we mean. So I'm not going to, I probably won't be talking about that meaning of the word life much at all in this class. It might pop up from time to time in the readings. I'm trying to think, I think there's a character. It's been so many years since I've read that book, but there's a character in the unbearable likeness of being. He's a bit of a womanizer, you know, sleeps around a lot, never made a woman's woman. And but he's a very brilliant physician, and he's very much into body. Right? Like he's just very, very unspiritual. He's very like, hey, experience is bullshit, right? right. Life is about fun and sex right. and hedonism and that sort of thing. You know, he's very much I mean, maybe maybe he sees life as just that. Right? It's just that. You know, I remember I was at a party one time when I was a grad student, and this guy found out we were philosophy. We, philosophy majors are kind of annoying at parties. You know, we're sitting in our corner talking about philosophy. So this guy was getting all annoyed, kind of meathead guy, and he said, philosophy. He's like, let me tell you what it's all about. You eat, you shit, you die. So something, something like that, right? <laughs> right? That was his life philosophy. I was like, wow, that's, that's brilliant. Man. I'm going to drop my classes next semester and sign up for your wisdom, you know, or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean that's maybe the kind of that's one approach. Right. You know, it's, you know, all this talk about meaning of life is just all highfalutin. It sounds all spiritual, but really it's just you know, come on, you guys are looking for something deeper when there really isn't anything. Right. I think that's kind of to me silly. <laughs> maybe I just I feel too important or whatever like that. I'm not a religious person, but uh, I think you know even if there's no higher meaning besides your own life. Still, don't you want to live a meaningful life? Don't you want to have something besides just eating and shitting and dying? I mean, come on. Isn't there more to it than that? Even if it's all fake, even if all the things you really care about don't really, really matter, isn't it still cool to care about things? Don't you want it? You know, that's kind of my response to that, that sort of attitude. But uh, let me, like I told you, let me see how we're doing on time. Before I let you go, I want, I want to give you some ammunition. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes, so we're good. I want to give you some ammunition for the first reading because it is a difficult reading. Uh, it's, uh, some of it is not so bad, but Kierkegaard uses a lot of technical terminology and he has very specific meaning for these words. So if I don't at least give you a little bit of vocabulary, you're going to be lost. Um, Kierkegaard is the only philosopher that we're covering this semester who was very religious. All the other readings will be from, I guess they're all atheists. I'm not really sure. Uh, what Kunera's religious beliefs were, but uh, the way he writes the book, it seems like he's pretty secular. Uh, I think, you know, so uh, Kierkegaard was a Christian. 
But he was a Christian in a very unique sense of the word. Once we start talking about Kierkegaard, you're going to, you know, okay, wow, well, that's a little different. Um, but Kierkegaard, even though he was Christian, he was writing about Christian themes. Like you're going to see in the first reading, he goes over the story of Abraham from the Old Testament. He tries to understand what was going through Abraham's mind when he was walking up that hill with Isaac. You know, how could he have been willing to do the horrible deed and what must he have been doing to justify it to himself? So it's a sort of psychological analysis of that episode from the Old Testament. And he's trying to, through this, through this engagement with, with the book, he's trying to understand what faith really is. So for Kierkegaard, he thinks that there are uh, basically three different ways that one can approach one's existence. Um, sometimes he calls these stages. I don't think he uses that terminology in the, what we're reading, but he'll talk about stages along life's way. And again, these are different ways that we will approach our life, that we will approach our existence. Now, the first one that he usually mentions, he calls the aesthetic. After that, you have what's called the ethical. And then last but not least is the religious. So he distinguishes between these three terms. So you'll see when you, when you get to the reading, he uses the word the aesthetic, the ethical, the religious a little bit less. Uh, but let me explain what he means by this. Now, again, these are different ways that we will approach our life. The aesthetic is when we see everything in terms of boring or interesting. Those are our two main values that drive our life. We don't want to be bored. So that's the sort of value dichotomy. We want to make our life as interesting as possible with as little boredom as possible. Boredom is the root of all evil, writes Kierkegaard. As he is. Kierkegaard is interesting because Kierkegaard, he always writes as someone else. Not always, but almost all the time he takes on a pseudonym. Like in this book, Fear and Trembling, where he talks about Abraham and Isaac, he takes on the pseudonym, I'm Johannes the Silencian. I'm John the Silent. I can't speak. I can't say. There's no way to say it because it's unspeakable, right? Faith is beyond the speakable or something like this, right? So, but in other, other books, he takes on other personas. And in one of his books, he takes on the persona of the esthete, and he says, boredom is the root of all evil. You have to make your life as interesting as possible. You can't have too many attachments because they get boring. See the same person all the time, same lover all the time. You gotta, you gotta kind of set things up so it's always fun and spicy, right? You ever seen that movie? Uh, probably not. The, the maybe some of the older students. This is Spinal Tap. No, it's it's a funny movie. It's, it's like a fake documentary about this really dumb rock band. You know, they're like these metalhead guys. Spinal Tap. There's a scene at the end where the credits are rolling. They're talking to one of the roadies about, like, they're like, hey, man, what's your philosophy of life? And he's like, I just want to have a good time all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the aesthetic, right? Now, what's the problem with that way of living, you think? What's going to happen if all you do is spend your time looking, searching for the next party and the next fun time? Life will pass you by, but in, in what way? What do you think? Some people might be able to do it. Your Keith Richards, maybe you do this your whole life. Man, just rock out and party out. Yeah, I mean, what, you, might, you might feel empty. Yeah. After one. After one. Yeah, you also feel empty, right? It's like, you know, after the first few hook downs, you're like, this is exciting, like a movie on. You're like, man, I feel just used up, and there's nothing. I don't even remember the name of half these people. You're just like, dude, I need to get like, a serious relationship that actually means, actually, you know, so. This is what typically happens is, you know, you veer into what he calls the ethical. And this is when you start to establish values. You start to see things not as boring or interesting, uh, but as good or evil. You, know, you want to be good and avoid evil. And this is a bit of a misleading way to, to call it the ethical. Um, and especially to the example that he gives, he usually talks about marriage. You know, when a guy gets married, you know, the aesthetic guy doesn't have any commitments. He just wants to have fun. So he's not going to commit to some woman. He's like, if she's interesting, I'll stay with her. And if she gets boring, I'll find something else. Whereas the, married, the guy that gets married, he says, I'm going to be with her through thick and thin. 
And he's gonna have a stronger sense of himself, who I am, what I stand for, what I don't stand for, where my values lie. Whereas the aesthetic person, they reinvent themselves every five months because they get bored with their own, you know what I mean? So yeah. like, they don't have that strong sense of identity, right? right? So these are just the fun lover party animal. And then this is the one, oh, man, I need to actually get serious and have some meanwhile. I need to get married, start a family, work on my career, whatever it is, right? And again, this is a bit misleading because I think you can be ethical in his sense of the word and actually be unethical in what we think. Like I would say someone like the Wolf of Wall Street might be ethical in the sense that for him, it's good to make a shitload of money. And it's evil to be broke. Right. So anything that gives me money is justified, right? Now usually Kierkegaard uses nicer examples, getting married and having a commitment, but it could be just as much, you, again, you have a code of values and you stick to it. Right. Now the religious, he says, is beyond that. This is what he's gonna focus on in our first reading is the religious. Most of us, he says, we spend our whole lives oscillating between these two, right? It's like when I was in Austin, my last like two or three years of undergraduate, I was working my ass off. I was working 40 hours plus a week. I was taking 12 to 14 hours of school. You know, it was just killing me, you know? And I was, like, I was just like, man, I need to go have some fun, man. I'm tired of this, you know? I need to party. Like I'm working at Whole Foods, all these hippies are throwing party, beer keger parties with bands playing at their house every weekend. And I, and I gotta study for my German exam. You know, I'm like, this, you know, so I want to party, you know. But then again, you do the partying for a while, and you get burnt out on that, and you're like, man, I need to get my shit together. So it's sort of like most of us, he says, we just oscillate between these two extremes. We either want to be less than what we are, we want to be some animal, some brute animal, just enjoy us pleasure, or we want to be something higher. We want to build up some ethical values and stand by it. We're we're always in the middle. We're human. We're not beasts. We're not God. We're we're, we're human, right? Some of us might take this leap into the religious, right? And the distinction here is not good and evil, it's not boring and interesting, it's faith, it's what we want, or despair. That's the distinction, right? Now, despair, what does that mean? We'll get into faith, because that's more complicated when we get to the reading. But for him, despair, what he means by that is failing to be yourself, not being who you he thinks most of us are in despair. Almost all of us are in despair. You know? One of the things he thought was really bad about his contemporaries, he was living in Denmark in like the late or mid 1800s. He thought that most of the people that were his countrymen, they were under this false illusion that they were actually Christian. Why did they think they were Christian and they weren't? He said, well, they thought they were Christian because if you were born in Denmark in the 1800s, you were automatically given citizenship of Denmark and you automatically given membership in the church. So you're a Christian, right? No, it's too To be a Christian, to have faith, is not something you just declare. It's not just a set of beliefs you decide, oh, I, that's true, I believe. I, I'm a good Christian now. It's something you have to live with. And you're gonna see, when you read the beginning of this essay, he makes this very unusual comparison between someone who has faith and someone who's a skeptic. He mentions this philosopher Descartes, Rene Descartes, who is famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. You know, that's his most, I think, therefore I am. He said that because he didn't know if he knew anything. And he's like, maybe it's all, you know, he's like an ultimate skeptic. You, you know, he had lived through this time period, the scientific revolution, when all these things that he thought were true turned out to be false. You know, everyone thought that the, the earth was in the middle of the universe and that the, all the planets revolved around. Like all this stuff is being debunked. And so Descartes is like, how do I even know anything? How do I know that it's not like this whole existence is all fake and I'm living in some hologram fake reality, right? How do I know anything? Well, he said, well, at least I know I exist, right? I think therefore I am. But he was a, he was a pretty big skeptic until he finally you know, thought that he worked his way out of it. And, 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 and Kierkegaard mentions Descartes at the beginning here and he says, Descartes was much like Abraham in a certain sense. He didn't actually say that, but he's making a comparison. He says, having faith and being a skeptic like Descartes, very similar, right? So how can he, and this is what I think he means by that. Descartes lived in a time period when, again, all of these foundational beliefs, all these things that everyone believed were true, turned out to be false. And imagine you wake up tomorrow and, and you're on the, and the news comes on and says, 
hey, actually we were wrong. The Earth is in the center of the universe. We got it backwards. Like, you'd be like, what the, how did they get that wrong? You know? And this was Descartes. And so Kierkegaard talks about, like, yeah, he really did doubt. He truly doubted. But do we truly doubt when we hear about Descartes? Like, when we're sitting here in our desks and, you know, we're thinking about, like, how do I even know if life is real? How do I know? Maybe, yeah, Professor Ross, he was talking about it could be a hologram. Maybe it is a hologram. Like, gee, like, you know, you get in these, like, thought experiments. But as soon as you close your book, you close your laptop, and you walk out of the room, do you really doubt your existence? Are you going to doubt your existence when a, when a car is coming straight on for you? Maybe it's not real, and I don't, I'm just a hologram. I want you to see what I am. No. Like, you don't really doubt, right? You might pretend it out as, like, a, a philosophical exercise, but Descartes really doubted. He really doubted because he lived through all that. He went to all the finest schools, finest universities, learned all the greatest, most up-to-date science from all the, the most brilliant men, and then it was all wrong. It was all wrong. And so he really doubted. So faith is something similar, says Kierkegaard. You don't just have it, like, oh, yeah, I, I read that book, it makes sense, and yeah, okay, yeah, I'm Christian now, I'm Buddhist now. Whatever. No, it, it, for him, it requires you to actually live through something, an ordeal that gives you focus and, and, and makes you understand what it is about your life that you really do have faith about. And so he uses the story of Abraham as a sort of analysis of faith, and he, he claims that even though there's no way for us to explain it, somehow when Abraham took that child, Isaac, up to the mountain where he thought he was going to murder him, there was this moment where it all became clear to him. And he understood, like, okay, I've been trying to rationalize it. I've been trying, but this is this is my reason, right? This is why I'm here, right? And this is a pretty, I like that Kierkegaard does this because he's not shy. But a lot of Christians, they try to ignore all this stuff about Abraham willing to kill. Oh, he knew it was a test and all this stuff. But Kierkegaard's like, no. Like, let's read the book and what it says. This dude was going to kill his son. He was ready to kill his freaking son. How can you justify that rationally? You can't. But somehow, we all have our Isaac, says Kierkegaard. We all have something that gives our life purpose and meaning, but we're in despair. We don't want to be honest about it. We want to be what others want us to be. We want to be like our favorite celebrity. We want to be whatever, right? We've got this image in our head of this is how I'm supposed to act. When I, what are you really, what, what, is, what is your gift, as Picasso says? What is your true gift? Now share it, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think that, you know, for him, faith is something very personal and very unique to the individual. And it requires at least the prospect, if not the actuality loss. One has to lose a lot to know what one values. You know, there's a quote from, I think, Schopenhauer once said, that moments of loss are the most important because they tell us the real value of things. You know? Which is, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, at least women in my life, they do too personal, but, you know, they, they get all like butthurt after the breakup and, and, and all this stuff, you know. But, um, you know, sometimes I think, you know, you can go through something and lose something, and it's not that you didn't appreciate it when you had it, but you didn't really know what it mattered to you, right? Like, you knew it mattered. Like, you knew you'd be sad if you lost it, but it wasn't until it was gone that you were like, shit, that, that's what that meant to me. And that's why I feel empty or there's this you know, piece missing. That's not something you can formulate scientifically. It's something that one experiences and lives through. But only few of us, most of us, don't want to cover it up because it's difficult. It's not easy to face right. up to the. It, it requires us to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, basically. Right. I, I don't want to get too off topic, but he uses, the, I think he uses it in one of his other works, the story of Cain uh, and Abel from the Bible, the first two brothers. And, you know, Cain was the one who tried to fake it. Mm -hmm. Abel was Abel. He actually did it. Right. And it's a lot easier to fake it and try to, you know, whatever, but it's not, it's not authentic. Yeah, yeah, it's, not, it's not right. It's not what right. you're meant to do. Yeah. So anyways, I think I've rambled on, isn't it? Past, yeah, it's sorry, two minutes over. I said I was going to let y'all go early, but so much for that. All right, see you guys on Zoom, hopefully on Wednesday, and I'll see you a week from today here in the class. Thanks for showing up.